<laughs> well, okay, guys, look. I'm going I'm I'm to be talking about world building today, okay? And that's important, and it's something that, to be totally honest, I do better than a lot of people, which is why my novels work. But the thing that is the most critical thing for any writer to understand is that what sells your work, what buys you readers, is your voice. It's the unique way in which you tell the story. It has to be a strong voice, but more importantly almost, it has to be yours. Even a voice that isn't the very strongest one out there, if it is uniquely yours, if it resonates with a readership, will work. Whereas becoming a pastiche of somebody else won't work. All right? So you have to develop your own voice, but at the same time you have to realize that your voice is the product of every single author you've ever read. Okay, every single author you've ever read is one little coral in that reef of your voice that you're building. And you have to be willing to allow that to happen without deliberately copying another writer. Okay, and sometimes people do it because of a writer they admire so much. You know, this is the gold standard of the stories that I like. I want to be this person. Okay, who you want to be is someone like that person. All right? And if, if you, John Paul Jones, my favorite John Paul Jones quote for writer's workshops has nothing to do with not giving up. <coughs> I mean, that's important too, because you have to keep plugging. Okay? But what John Paul Jones said that I think is especially relevant to new authors or people who haven't sold yet is, it seems to be a law inflexible and inexorable that he who will not risk cannot win. Mm -hmm. You have got to be willing to fail before you can succeed. If you don't, you're going to be like a whole bunch of people I've known who are like, I could be a writer. I could be a writer. And all of a sudden, it will seem like all of a sudden they're 75 and it's I could have been a writer. Because if you're not willing to find out, to have a publisher if you go the traditional route, uh, to have your readership if you go the indie route, not buy your books and tell you that, no, you can't be a writer. If you're not willing to risk that happening, you never will be a writer. I sold my first novel in 89 at the age of 36. And I could have been sold, I could have been published 10 years earlier if I'd been willing to risk failing. And I have like going on 90 novels right now. Think what I could have done with another 10 years. Okay. Now, I won't say that I regret those 10 years because those 10 years made me who I am. But I could have been published 10 years earlier than I was. Um, so if you think, if you have the storytelling bug, if you don't have the storytelling bug, this ain't going to work for you anyway. <laughs> and nobody can give that to you. It's just like nobody can give you imagination. Okay, But there are people out there who can help cultivate both the storytelling bug and the use of imagination. And there are people out there like the teacher in the Harry Chapin song, Flowers Are Red, who can kill your imagination dead mm -hmm. as a freaking doornail. Okay? And oftentimes they don't even realize they've done it. Um, and that's one reason why I try very hard to be the second teacher. There's so many colors in the rainbow. Let's use every one. Okay? And it's one reason I do as many collaborations as I do right now. Um, I turned 70 in October. Okay? And that means, best case, <laughs> okay, ah, if I'm Jack Williamson, I might be like another 60 years. Okay, anybody <laughs> else? You know, you know, 20, 30, okay. Um, and then, you know, one way or the other, I'm done. Okay, well, I have a skill set that I spent 33 years building to this point, all right? One of the reasons I do collaborations is to share that skill set with writers who I know, who I think have the potential to be the names, to, to, to succeed at this craft, to share that skill set with them. Because it's a perishable commodity, for me at any rate, you know, because I'm a perishable. 
Um, and that's why I do collaborations, that's why I do workshops. And it's why I'm here, because I've never been an indie. I've never been self-published. Um, so my business model experience is not going to match the business model that most of you guys are looking at. What I do have to offer you is a peek into how you transition to traditional publishing if you are in a position to add that to your quiver. Okay. But it's also, the story of writing craft is the same, no matter what the, the venue in which you're published. Okay, what goes into writing stories that work doesn't matter whether you're self-published. I tell people, I tell people the greatest thing about the internet and the electronic publishing is that we get to see so much stuff we would never have seen otherwise. The worst thing about the internet and the electronic publishing is we get to see so much stuff we never would have seen otherwise. Okay, and you guys especially are dealing with the how does a reader filter the content to find the stuff out there that is getting lost in the, in the underbrush, okay? I can't help you on the marketing side of how you do that, but if I can help you on how you develop the voice, how you deal with your characters, how you build your universes to pull you up out of the underbrush, then maybe I've contributed something to your success as well. And that's why I'm here, okay? Excuse uh, me, I, I read a, a yeah, go ahead. Uh, article by might have been Jerry Cornell. Mm -hmm. This was like 30 years ago, maybe. Yes, Jerry was actually writing before me. Yes, and he was he was talking about the democratization of, of publishing and how in as things you know he, he was predicting all this basically. Well, I said, and he and he, he said that his prediction was well, it's going to have to be like uh, successful authors who people respect presenting these younger and unknown authors to get through the, yes. the signals of the Sponsoring. Yeah. Really. And that's one of the things that I'm doing with collaborations. I was like somebody like um, Jacob Hola, who did the Gordian Protocol with me, and who is going to be doing a, uh, an Autoverse trilogy. Um, we're going to be doing the, the, the yeah, we're going to be doing the cap, uh, we're going to be Edward Saganami's career from the Autoverse. Um, and I am seriously at this moment, Eric, he kind of looked at me like, say what, when I told him this. Um, I am kind of looking at him as probably uh, the um, inheritor of the universe. Wow. Um, he is... That would a, be a frightening burden to bear. <laughs> but he is, he is a truly outstanding uh, writer, in my opinion. Uh, unfortunately, Tony and I introduced him to police procedurals, and he really wanted to disappear. 87th precinct, wow! <laughs> you know, so it's been, you know, between that and this desire that he has to blow up universes. I put him on a reducing <laughs> diet. He cannot blow up a universe except in the books that are going to end in protocol. He can blow up universes in those books. And I'm like, he's like, okay. Because what he wants to do this next time around, well, what we want to do, and he's chomping at the bit to do, is to basically kill every single character from the existing novels. <laughs> and I'm like, Jacob, I'm not sure about this. Let's think about it. And I said, wait, we can, okay, that would work. <laughs> you know, so we can actually make it work and the readers won't be pissed with us. And I'm like, well, that's a remarkable achievement. <laughs> um, of course, at the end, with time travel, you can do all kinds of cheaty things, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, um, world building. Depending on the kind of story you want to tell, there are tons of resources available or a few kilograms of resources available when you get ready to start building. Okay. If you are going to be doing a contemporary novel that is set on this planet, then world building is basically just research. Okay? I mean, your, will, your world building will consist of the particular environment you're building for your characters out of the research that you've done of real world events, geography, et cetera. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean people bother to do it, but it's straightforward, okay? 
Now you can also get into trouble. One of my favorite authors in all the world is Dean Koontz, who has managed to avoid being categorized as a genre author, I think, pretty, pretty well, despite writing some darn good science fiction. But one of his researchers obviously misplaced the decimal point. He is firmly convinced that every Uzi has a 300-round magazine. <laughs> <laughs> now, if an Uzi had a 300-round magazine, you would get very accurate shooting from it because it would have little wheels on the bottom <laughs> of the magazine, and every time you fired, you'd be firing from a brace. Okay, that kind of thing can happen even to a Dean Koontz. Okay. So when you are doing research, I have been bitten by this a time or two myself, something that I thought I knew so thoroughly I didn't bother to check has come back to bite me, okay? So if, unless you are absolutely positive, if there's something you're gonna stick into a story that is going to be critical to how that story is working out, check and make sure <laughs> that you have it right, okay? Uh, because if you don't, trust me, there is a reader out there who will know that you got it wrong. And he will, if you're lucky, they will send you an email and they will tell you. Now, um, Aaron Flint and I did um, uh, 1635, The Baltic War and the Ring of Fire. We had handed the book in and had been through copy edit and the type had been set and that was when one of his readers in Denmark who had had the manuscript for like six months got around to telling us that we had designed Copenhagen Harbor wrong <laughs> <laughs> and there was not a thing we could do about it at that point and I was like Eric, you were in Copenhagen. I took your word for it. He says, well, what were you thinking? You should have left it <laughs> out. <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah. All right. But moving on to building a non-contemporary universe. All right. If you want to write historical novels, it's kind of the same as a contemporary universe, except you have to do even more research. The other thing that you really need to be careful about, this is my personal opinion, is you really need to avoid presentism if you're going to write a historical novel. And people do a lot of that, especially when they have ideological axes to grind. Flipping the other way, I was told by a critic one time that I was the first post-feminist science fiction writer. And I'm like, what the hell is a post-feminist science fiction writer? And what she was getting at was there are no glass ceilings in the honorverse unless you're on Grayson, okay? And I built Grayson expressly to give honor some glass ceilings to help kick out, if you follow me. But in most of my, my science fiction, nobody questions whether they, they think honor's a loose cannon, they think she's a lunatic, you know, the whole nine yards. Nobody says she shouldn't be a starship captain because she's a woman, okay? And it's like I tell people, in honors universe, whether or not a, a specific gender is appropriate to a job has all the burning relevance to them that Pharaoh's policy towards the Hittites has to us, because it's a done deal, okay? And my view is that's the strongest statement you can possibly make about equality you're assuming that it's there because people are smart enough to realize that that's where you need to be. And half the human race isn't stupid enough to put up with not being allowed to be there, and the other half of the human race isn't stupid enough to tell them, nah, nah, forget about it, okay? Um, cultures that refuse to do that are the ones that my grandchildren won't be competing with, is the way that I see it, all right? Okay, but, if you're going to do historicals, I'll try to avoid, where I was going with that in part was Marion Zimmer Bradley before the stuff came out about her and the kids and like that. One of the things that I really disliked about many of her dark over novels was that her characters from like the Terran Empire or whatever they had, the, the, you know, the galactic civilization, they were facing exactly the same challenges in the 30th century that women were facing in the first half of the 20th century, okay? And it really destroyed my ability to accept that this was a real culture, a real civilization, okay? I don't think that she really intended for me, you to be able to, but as a story, 
it significantly damaged the story. As a polemic tract, it might have been it might have been appropriate. As a story, it was not. Okay, so historical got that off the table. So now we get into you're going to build science fiction uh, universe or a fantasy universe, and I have built both. There are certain things that are going to be true in any universe that you're going to build. The first one is, what kind of universe is it? Is it science fiction? Is it magic? Are you going to be mainly interested in paranormal stuff? You know, where are you going to go? You have to have that nailed down before you begin. Okay? The second thing that you need to be aware of is that however your universe, whatever your universe is based on, there has to be what I think of as a consistent physics for it. Whether it's magic, whether it's science fiction, or whatever, you have to understand that you have to build a system for how it works, how the machinery works, how the transportation works, how the industrial processes work, that makes sense, is logical within the constraints you've set up, that you will maintain continuity on as the series proceeds, and that has limitations built in to present the characters with challenges. The limitations are more important than what they can do, because the limitations are what define the struggle that your characters have to contend with. So, you have to have all of that kind of in place in the back of your mind before you really begin work at all. All right, the next thing that you have to think about is geography. And that's true whether you're writing something that sprawls across galaxies or is concentrated on a single planet. Because when I say geography here, I'm not talking about necessarily one world or whatever, but you have to have a feel <coughs> for the physical arena in which you're going to set this novel. Are you going to write a novel like Honor Harrington, where you have an interstellar war raging over scores of star systems? Or are you going to write a novel like uh, Hell's Gate, where you have three different civilizations and alternate universes living on the same physical planet? Okay, totally different geographical parameters for those two books. And you have to know, when you're going in, what the geographical parameters for your book are going to be, okay? So once you have that general geography in mind, then you need to think about specific geography. What I mean by that is, if you're building an honorverse, you have to think about the planet Sphinx, the planet Manticore, the planet Griffin, the planet Nouveau Paris. You have to visualize those planets. I found that it really helps if you can get uh, a good uh, map generator program, which they make dozens of now, I think, for different uh, fantasy games, and generate some planets, and look at them and say, does this do what I need to do? When I did the Safe Hold books, okay, when I did the Honorverse books, I built the, 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 the planets first, and then <coughs> planned the story. When I did the Safe Hold books, I built the planet first, and then figured out who was going to be what, based on the geography that I'd established in, in the map. So you can come at it a couple of ways. Um, but you have to be able to visualize the actual planet that your characters are walking around on, if they're going to be walking around on a planet. You don't necessarily have to do it in enormous detail, but please remember that your planet is bigger than Connecticut. <laughs> okay, there are going to be variations of flora and fauna. No ice planets. Well, you can build an ice planet if you're far enough out. It's just everybody lives in a heated enclave, you know. And, and why did they bother to colonize that world? Why did they just build an orbital habitat to be done with it? Which is another thing you have to bear in mind when you're building a planet. Okay, it has to make sense for people to live where they live. All right, now, well, why do, why do they live here? Because they got shipwrecked. Okay, that'll work, you know, but there has to be a reason that they live where they live. When I decided to stick the Graysons on the planet Grayson in this heavy metal environment, this toxic environment, there had to be a reason that they didn't say, you know what, this was a bad idea, let's go somewhere else. So I had them, you know, basically 
decommission the cryo facilities on their ship. They delivered their, their religious nuts, although they weren't quite as nutty as a lot of people thought in the beginning of Honor of the Queen. I, one of my one of my fondest achievements is at the beginning of the Honor of the Queen, everybody hates the Graysons. At the end of it, they're going, you go, Grayson! <laughs> like, okay, I work. Yeah. But anyway, uh, but you, there had to be a reason that they lived there. Jim Bain and I used to argue because he was like, well, we're inevitably going to go to the stars and colonize other planets. I was, why? And he said, because. And I said, if I'm going to live my entire life on a generation ship cruising from here to Proxima Centauri or Arcturus, why don't I just build an orbital habitat out in the asteroid belt and stay right here? Because <laughs> I'm going to have exactly the same environment either way. And he was like, because. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was like, okay. You know. <laughs> so there has to be a reason that people are going where they're going in your world, whether it's science fiction or fantasy. Okay. All right. And a reason they're fighting each other, too. Beg your pardon? And a reason they're fighting each other, too. Well, they may not necessarily be fighting each other. They just happen to do that in most of my books. I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, some, you can do a really good novel, a really good story about fighting the environment. Okay. Um, there does, this is a side, a segue, which is rich ball, from, <laughs> from world building. But the struggle that your characters are facing, what they have to overcome, can be huge, it can be small, it can be existential, it can be only important to me because my life will be devastated on an individual basis if I don't get where I need to go. It can be a war. It can be a pandemic. It can be anything that your storyteller, your storytelling person needs it to be. The problem is that whatever it is, it has to be well told. And a weak story that is strongly told will succeed where a strong story that is weakly told will fail. The story can be about anything like deciding who to go to the prom with to fighting off the end of the world. But if the readers don't care about the people involved in that struggle, if you can't make that struggle important enough to the characters that it's important to the reader, then the story's going to fail, no matter how grand and glorious the, the struggle you have in mind is. Okay, And that also really does go to the world building, too. Because when you're building the world, you're building the stage, the arena in which your characters are going to contend. And it needs to be one that will allow them to contend on the level that your storytelling expects them to contend upon. Okay? A lot of people looking at the Honor Harrington books see them primarily as the story of Honor Harrington. And so some of them get pissed when I do books that Honor's not in. Okay, I have always seen them as the telling of this vast struggle that spread across these various star systems and whatnot, in which Honor Harrington is a central, possibly even the central figure. But all these, you know, generals and admirals do not win wars by themselves. And the most brilliant commander in the universe can be in only one place at one time. One of the problems that people run into when they're writing historical novels set around Horatio Hornblower uh, or uh, Richard Bolitho, if you've read any of the yeah. Alexander Kent novels. Okay. Hornblower can't be in all the major battles because Hornblower wasn't in all the major battles, and he didn't play a critical role in any of the major battles, okay? And besides that, he couldn't physically have been at all of them, even if they'd been willing to bounce him around from fleet to fleet. So you have to come up with these entire secondary theaters, these secondary battles and whatnot. And there's a limit to the extent to which you can make them pivotal to the outcome of the war. Now, in historical fiction, that's kind of baked into the DNA, because we already know who were the pivotal figures who won, won the war. In historical fiction, in, in science fiction, 
the pivotal figures are whoever we make the pivotal figures, but they still cannot be present at every decisive <coughs> moment of the war. Okay, if you, if that, in theory you could do that, all right, but it's bad storytelling. Your characters have, you have to allow your primary characters to be supported by secondary characters. There are people who think I have too many characters in my novels, okay? But one of my rules of thumb is, I do not have an unnamed character in my novel if he's going to appear more than four or five times. I'm not gonna call him the lieutenant every time Honor talks to him. If he's on the bridge of her ship, he's got a name or she's got a name. I've got a physical description that I wrote. This is part of the world building. I have a physical description that I wrote down of that character. It may not be real detail, but hair color, eye color, height, build, uh, gender, um, often planet of origin, always age at the time that that character is created. And I try to give even characters who are maybe not going to be in, in remotely important characters in that novel, some hook for me. Um, uh, a little fact about them that is going to cause them to have a special attitude about this problem or that problem. Uh, a, a, a figure of speech that is, is going to be theirs. I've got characters that I have noted things like uh, uses precisionist English, never uses contractions. And then I remind myself that that. And that all goes into building not just the character but the world because that's one of the mosaic chips in the world that you're building. Is that in, in the, in the Mutiner's Moon novels, <coughs> Dahak has never used a single contraction. If you go through the entire book, you will not find a single contraction for Dahak, even though I use them in narrative, okay? And that gets baked into this is Dahak's voice when I hear it. And it, it, it cuts down on the number of tags that you need to put in there, like Dahak said. Okay, it's like, <laughs> anybody else would have used a contraction, it's what the hell's going on, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, what the hell is going on? Okay, well, that was Dahak. <laughs> Otherwise, there'd been a contraction in there, you know. Um, these are all little tricks that go to not just character building, but also world building, because you're building the environment of the other characters when you build the character. <laughs> because again, this is something they're all going to be reacting to and reacting with them. All right, so to get back to the, the big building blocks. So you've established the geography, you've established the planet, you've established the tech base. Presumably, when you get ready to write this story, you have an idea of the kind of story you want to write. Is this going to be a military story with a great sweeping war? Is this going to be a story about scientific research? Is this going to be whatever? Okay. With that in mind, you then have to create the societal and the political environment in which your characters are going to live and breathe and do their thing. Okay. If it's a war between competing ideologies, competing views, then you have to build both sides. And you have to play fair with both sides. A lot of people looking at the, um, the People's Republic of Haven in the early books see them as a condemnation of any notion that you can have a viable long-term uh, nation with a safety net and so forth. That it would always get out of hand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I do think that there is some risk of that in any, any state in which uh, there is uh, too comfortable uh, a safety net. But if you get fur as you get further and further into the books, you begin to discover that the mess the Havenites are in is the result of a, a corrupt political deal in which the families, the legislature's families, the political elite that are running the system made a deal with the administrators, administrators of the, of the the basic living stipend and whatnot, to keep the legislators in power by a constantly increasing stream of patronage and, and bread and circuses, okay? And so, no, I'm not saying that you can't provide for all of your citizens. What I'm saying is this is how societies get corrupted by using that to buy power, all right? That's actually the subtext of, of the People's Republic of Haiti. Um, 
but partly because of people's own presentism. When they read the early books, especially, that's how it strikes a great many people. That's what they think I'm saying. Now, I will confess, and I had a conversation about this yesterday, that while I don't normally steal history intact to build societies, I did my absolute damnedest in the Honor Harrington books to make everybody look at the People's Republic of Haven as France on the eve of the revolution. I pulled out all the stops, Tennis Cordo, Robes, Pierre, Committee of Public Safety. I was shameless. <laughs> and that was because it was actually something else entirely, but I wanted you looking at this hand over here because that way you kept expecting it worked. You kept expecting Esther McQueen to be Napoleon, okay? You had no clue that Thomas Theisman was going to turn up over here and be Cincinnati restoring the Constitution. Or at least that was what I had in mind. And then when I killed her, everybody was like, whoa, whoa, wait, <laughs> what happened to Napoleon? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Ha <laughs> Anyway, uh, so you have to build your societies. Okay, I am a historian by training. I don't know if that shows in any of my books. Um, as a matter of fact, I was a military and diplomatic historian. I did my master's thesis on Anglo-American relations and the suppression of the African slave trade, which was actually a fascinating topic, uh, even before I got a hold of it. But um, being a student of history helps when you're going to build society. Okay, you have to be careful not to lift them. This is my personal view. Okay? You have to be careful not to just lift them up from over here and plop them down over there. Okay? What I do, and a lot of people I think don't realize this until they look at it pretty carefully. I take, I'm sort of a sort of a magpie when I start building worlds. I take bits and pieces from history from all over and I weave them together to create something that is not those historical entities that I am borrowing from, but that partakes of their DNA, okay? So for example, in Safehold, okay, uh, the, kingdom of, the kingdom of Cheris, okay? It has an awful lot in common with uh, Great Britain, but that's because it's an island and because it is a naval power, okay? When you start getting deeper and deeper into the books, you begin to realize that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in chairs that really doesn't have a counterpart in the UK's history, okay? Readers appreciate that even when they don't realize that's what they're seeing, okay? You have to understand that when you're building a world or a character or a story, there's a bunch of stuff in there that the reader doesn't know is there, doesn't realize is there, but that the reader absorbs while you're doing it. This is where continuity and characters, mannerisms, and speech comes in. Okay, It's where continuity in your world building comes in. If there are things, I, I know I'm famous for info dumps, okay. There are things about the honorverse and how it works that I have never told you even now. But they're there so thoroughly in the background for me that they govern how things happen on a level that gives a degree of continuity that lets you understand what's going to happen next, even if I hadn't told you this is why it will happen next. Because that's how the honorverse works. You see what I'm saying? People have, I got a lot of criticism at one point, um, I still do in some quarters, over the lack of AI in the honorverse. I point out to people, I say, okay, well, first of all, Honor Harrington was born two years before Al Gore invented the internet. Okay, <laughs> just, you guys need to remember that. Okay. But the other thing is the, 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 the honorverse has always been lousy with AI. It's just so thoroughly baked into their technology that nobody thinks about it, okay? These people control starships with joysticks, <laughs> okay? You don't do that without some pretty good AI support. Now, when I did decide for the Honorverse, because I had just recently done the Mutineer's Boom novels, um, and I had done uh, Path of the Fury, uh, with, and both of those had fully realized self-aware AI. Love Path of the Fury. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I went with in this case was because I want I needed I needed the technology to not mirror simply mirror what I'd done in the earlier books. So I decided that in this book, the people who argue that true artificial intelligence is probably a chimera that we'll never accomplish, that instead what we had was brilliant software, which in some ways was so good that nobody could tell the difference between it and self-aware hardware. Um, but it wasn't really relevant to the story that I was telling <coughs> until we started integrating more into the civilian side of things. And you have like uh, taxis with AI that are refining your destination by asking you questions kind of thing to, to be sure you're going where you need to go, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's one of those things that's in the background of the honorverse that I never really brought out and talked about, <coughs> but I always knew it was there. And if you go back and you read the stories with that in mind, you can kind of see it in the earlier books. Um, now there are a couple of things that I just didn't put in there because I didn't really see them coming. Some of them were, I mean, okay, for God's sake, I mean, going on 30 years since the first novel, okay? Give me a break, man. Uh, but um, when I wrote the, the first Donna Harrington novel, I hadn't bought my first bag phone, much less my first cell phone. <laughs> Okay, and so I talk about their communicators and whatnot, you know, but it's only, it, I, the, the uni link starts turning up much later with, with essentially, you know, the Apple Watch, you know, uh, 40th century style, you know, kind of thing. Um, sometimes, and this also goes to world building, you can retrofit things into the universe as long as it doesn't do violence to something you've already established. You can't go back and fix something that is flatly contradicted. For example, when I started the Honor Harrington novels, there was some debate, there was still a fairly lively debate over whether or not gravity was a light speed phenomenon. Okay? And I went with the, no, it's not. It's faster than light. Well, the more recent research seems to confirm that it is a light speed phenomenon. Well, that invalidates an awful lot of the technology in the honorverse. I can't go back and change that at this point. So I will just continue with, with what I had, and in the honorverse, that's how physics work. Uh, I tried to pay, play fair with everything except my particular isotopes of balonium. Okay. With the right isotope of balonium, you can do anything. Okay, I mean, you know, but you have to ration yourself. You can't. One of the few things that I think really holds up completely from the movie Avatar is that the resource there their mining is unobtainable, right? <laughs> okay, I just thought, you know, you might as well just go ahead, be honest about it up front and, and go with it. Um, but the so, the, so the tech has to be uh, consistent, the geography has to be nailed down, the political structures have to work. Okay, and you can't, Sharon had a fanfic story that somebody handed her. This was years and years ago before we were married. And it was all about this dictator. He's an awful person, okay? And he's just, you know, he's, he's, he's Idi Amin meets Saddam Hussein kind of guy, you know? But he has this really loyal inner cadre that props him up. And he does things like he rapes his number one henchman's wife, you know, kind of thing. And so Sharon asks the person who wrote this fanfic, says, why do they follow him? Because he's charismatic. Jeremy's like, he's charismatic. Yes, because he's charismatic. Uh huh. He's so charismatic that he raped my wife, and I still think he's the greatest thing that ever lived. Oh, he's charismatic. <laughs> Jeremy's like, no, he's not. <laughs> kind of like, okay. That goes into building worlds, not just into building characters. It goes into building societies as parts of that world. When I built Grayson, I was deliberately building a society which was for, which, which was going to be patriarchal. Okay. Now, Grayson women always had more rights than a whole bunch of present-day American readers looking at the book realized that they had. There were legal inhibitions, legal, legal restrictions on them that went back for a long time, 
and as you got further into the into the story, you began to discover what the reasons for them were. Okay, and I baked that in too because for me to have a society that had been isolated for a thousand years and still had these <coughs> restrictions in place, there had to be a reason for those restrictions to have existed. And if I was going to break those restrictions, I had to introduce a way to fix the cause of the restrictions. Okay? So, the cause of the restriction is we're this toxic spell dump of a, of a planet. Okay? There's the secret genetic modification that you don't find out about until, gosh, it's an Echoes of Honor, I think, maybe, in which Allison kind of unpacks it for, for Clint Scales that nobody knew about, which was necessary for them to survive. Because of the genetic modification, they have uh, an, this huge number of male stillbirths, so you have this huge disproportion of the population. In the early days, when you crank in the toxicity and everything else, huge number of, of women who are dying in, in, in childbirth and during pregnancy, they have to be protected, they have to be conserved, and men have to spread their genes as broadly as possible before they die because their lifespan is about 40 years. And this is for the one-third of the population that is born male to begin with. Okay, So all of these things go into building the society in which women have been restricted from what are considered to be the especially high-risk aspects of society. And it has grown into a, we, in order to protect them, we're going to put them in what we think, what we hope are really comfortable cages, okay? Because that, that, that's where they'll be safe. And you have these men who, 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 for want of a better term, bleed for the women who are carrying the burden of having to have pregnancy after pregnancy after pregnancy on a planet that's gonna kill you know, over half their children in, in their first few years. And it's like, my God, what else can I expect her to have to put up with, okay? I mean, that's a big factor in how Grayson is created. Okay, well then along comes Honor, he's a break through their glass ceiling kind of thing. But along comes Allison, and along comes the technology that Manticore can make available that can do something about this toxicity of their environment by building their domed cities. That can, that can help to, to, to clean their soil, who can fix the genetic issue, okay? And then this society, which has been bound by its environment so much to be what it was, can become something else. And I also baked into the, the whole notion of the doctrine of the test. Now, I am a Methodist. I was a Methodist lay speaker for forever. And what we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And by the way, the guy who invented that term wishes that he hadn't, because it implies that all four branches, all four arms of the quadrilateral are the same. But the quadrilateral is that first, everything you need to know is contained in in, in scripture. That secondly, uh, the writings of the church fathers and whatnot are your roadmap to what's in there so that you can find your way through it. Uh, third, that the most important thing is the Spirit of God, because unless the Spirit of God touches you, you won't enter into the Scripture and, and understand what's going on. But last but not least, God gave you reason for a purpose, and you're supposed to apply reason to whether or not what you, somebody is telling you now is consistent with what you already know and believe. Okay, That is the test on Grayson, and it's, part, it's baked in. You're supposed to question, you're supposed to test new beliefs, but you're also supposed to test old beliefs. And that is why Grayson is able to move as rapidly as it does once honor kind of kicks in the door. Okay, But all of that was built into my world when I built Grayson's society from the ground up. Okay, Now I hadn't developed every aspect of that in detail. But that was the given, that was the foundation on which I was going to erect this society. And then I built Masada, which by the way, got me labeled as an anti-Semite by one critic at Bain. <laughs> I said, <laughs> they cut the New Testament out of their Bible and they named their planet Masada. Obviously, David Weber hates Jews. To Jim Bain, who is Jewish, 
to Tony Weisskopf, who was Jewish, to Marla Ainspan, who was Jewish, you know, and I'm like, Jim, and he said, don't worry about it, there are nuts everywhere, you know, so okay, fine. <laughs> but you know, part of it is, okay, <laughs> Jim Baker, oh my God, okay. The, okay, this goes to world building too, but it's also, it's a, it's a funny story. All right. So I've written the first two Honor Harrington novels as one continuous project. Jim released them, I think, two months apart, when, which I think was one reason that they kind of hit the ground running. But, so I set the manuscripts in. I'm working on my next project. Phone rings, it's Jim. This is before cell phones, so you're paying for the long distance. Okay. I pick up the phone and say, yes, Jim. David, I, I have a problem with, with the manuscript. I'm like, yeah. He said, okay, so let me get this straight. The bad guys are the Republic of Haven. The good guys are the Star Kingdom of Manticore. He said, okay, everybody who ever saw Star Wars knows the Republic is the good guys. <laughs> the Manticores are man-eating monsters. I have a problem here. And I'm like, well, Jim, you know, it's that they, they're not going to give themselves an evil name. I said, you know, I said, the bad guys don't wake up one morning and say, let's call ourselves the omniveracity of evil. Okay. You know, it's like they're going to take a good name. And that's part of the whole point, is that they're going to take the good name, and it's not going to be who they are. We argued for 45 minutes. Okay. Long distance from New York on his dime. And finally, he said, well, okay, it doesn't bother me as much as it did. And, 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 and so, thank God we got past that. So I'm sitting there, and the phone rings. I pick it up. You made her ugly. Excuse me? You made her ugly. I said, I did not. He said, yes, you did. It says so right here. Big, overgrown, hatchet face. I said, that's her stealth image. Not. He, said, but, yeah. he says, you don't understand. Bane heroines have to be such that men lust after them and women lust to be them. I said, Jim, that is incredibly sexist. He said, sexist, sexist, it sells books. And I'm like, ah, you know. So I said, well, go forward to where Alistair McKeon lays eyes on her for the first time. And he flips a few pages. It's too late. They're already going to be decided that she's ugly. So I pulled it forward, you know, a little bit. I hanged the phone. That took another 30 minutes. And so we're like an hour and a half into his, in, in, of discussion into this. And he's like 18 pages into the manuscript. I mean, it's going to be a really, really long process. Okay, didn't have a single other complaint with any of it. Okay, and I managed. I, if you go back and you read Basilisk Station and uh, Honor the Queen back to back, you will notice a very interesting thing. The People's Republic of Haven is only referred to the people as the People's Republic of Haven in about five places in Basilisk Station. Okay. More frequently in Honor of the Queen, but still nowhere near as often as in the later books, and it's not until the short Victorious War that you start getting peeps. And that is because I figured out how to fix the Republic problem. I called him up and I said, I know Jim, we'll call them the People's Republic of Haven. He was like, that'll work. But the problem was the first book had already been typeset, and this was before you were doing electronic typesetting. Okay, so we had to find places where we could put it in that wouldn't change the, the page, the line break, okay? And, 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 yes, you, the, yeah, no, the antediluvian days of publishing. And, and the, the, uh, the honor of the queen, okay, was also uh, typeset at that point, but we had more lead time. So as long as we didn't change page breaks, we could go in and, and change it there. Um, but that goes to world building too. Because while, while you need as a writer to avoid presentism and readers need to avoid presentism if they're going to really understand what the story is, you do have to be aware that your readership is going to associate certain words with certain meanings, the, the tropes that you're using, whether, you, whether you're doing it deliberately and upfront and big or not, you're still using tropes. We, it's kind of the shorthand. It's one of the reasons that anime seems so strange to a lot of Western viewers until they get used to it. It uses different tropes. Oh, and speaking of anime and of movies, um, ADV is currently pitching a three-season anime of Mutineer's Moon. 
Um, and they are telling us that they expect to have two serious offers by the end of January. Now, that and five dollars will buy me a gallon of gas in California right now. Uh, but uh, it is no, still yeah. over five bucks. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Seven bucks. Well, but um, I've actually seen the, the presentation deck that they've done on it. It's very good. I would be completely satisfied with the way that they've got this laid out for, for what they want to do. And I am thinking that anime would, a successful uh, Mutineers Moon anime would probably open some more doors for things like the Honorverse or Infury Born. I honestly think that of all of my, my novels, uh, Infury Born or maybe the, uh, the Apocalypse Bill would be the best movie fodder. I would do um, In Fury Born in, as a two-part, and I would end it, I would end the first one with her resignation from the cadre, and begin the next one with the, mur the massacre of her family. Uh, basically, what, the, the only reason that In Fury Born exists is that people loved Path of the Fury, and they wanted it in hardcover, and it was originally released in mass market, and you don't normally release mass market paperbacks and hardcovers later. So I, what I figured I would do is I wrote the prequel. I had somebody say, he's just recycling it, you know, kind of thing. But over half that book is new material, okay? But I wrote the prequel and we bound them together to provide a hardcover and to expand the story and give you uh, Alicia DeVries' um, uh, backstory. Now, um, how many of you know Richard Fox? Okay, I met Richard at uh, Archer's Rest uh, some, what? Four or five years ago now, I think. Okay. Um, Richard and I have done Governor, which is a prequel to In Fury Born, and which, by the way, is, is pretty good. And uh, we spent a couple of hours uh, Wednesday, Tuesday morning, Tuesday morning, um, talking about the, the sequel to that, which we had already laid out in general terms. And he's going to be beginning work on the rough draft of that in the next few weeks. So hopefully that one will be done by and handed in by the end of January or so. All right, I have talked for 27 minutes. Oh, well, actually more than that. Yes, okay. A while. Well, we have three minutes, and I don't know exactly when we, you know, what's in here next. I know that uh, Sharon has a 2.30 one there, of the There chairs. is one. There is one in here, okay. I'm sorry, I, I meant to leave more time for questions. We have about three minutes, so does, is there a question out there specific that I can answer as quickly as I'm capable of answering a question? Anybody? Yes. How much do you think you need to have the history of the world, how things came to be what they were? You've talked about sort of, you had the story for yes. how Grayson developed. Yeah. How much of that do you need? A lot. Um, I wrote an 85,000 word tech bible before I wrote the first word of the Honor Harrington novels. And it included the technology, it included the history of the diaspora, it included the history of the start of the Romantic Corps and everything else. Not in detail, but with bullet point dates so that I could be sure that I kept it all consistent. And then, as I worked on the novel, I expanded the timeline. When I got into the later phases of the war, when I have more campaigns going on everywhere else, then I had to get really, really persnickety about timelines because I had to know that the messenger ship left Manticore when now and when it arrives over here. And of late, I have taken to actually incorporating the dates into the section heads and the chapter heads in the books which I wish I had done earlier. If I, were, if I, if I ever do a, a comprehensive revision of the earlier books, that's one of the things that's going to happen. Is we're going to actually stick dates into them so that people can keep track. And I do hope at Sunday to do a, uh, a revision of uh, War of Honor. War of Honor is about 30,000 words at least longer than it would have been if I hadn't had a competing project that kept me from going back and doing the final edit on it. And there are things, there's nothing in that book that doesn't need to be there, but some of it's in more than once. And I can, I need to go back and, and work on, on, but Tony is like, yes, in your copious free time, <laughs> you can go and do that, you know. All right, well, we are out of time. Thank you for coming.